Hey. Just wanted to check my mic. It works, yes. I'm uh, welcome. Woo-hoo. I'm not a boomer after all. Hey, hey good. <laughs> How's things? How are you? Good. Good. I'm good. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Dia, how's things? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, just want to share this tweet. Um, so yeah, maybe we can. Uh, while waiting for the others, I see there is Mr. Bitcoin Natuna from Natuna Island. <laughs> uh, welcome. Uh, I'm just gonna share the tweet for a bit, and then uh, we can start. Thank you. Hey, Maria. You're here as well. How are you? Hello, <laughs> Masahala. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm ready here, inshallah, for everyone. Zakalakhir. Perfect, perfect. Hey, so we have a very important topic today. It's uh, Bitcoin and Islamic finance in Indonesia's halal economy. And of course, it applies to all the other economies around the world. So, very excited. Uh, are you excited as much as I am um, to learn new things? Woo! <laughs> let's go, let's go. So, yeah, so we have um, Anwa, and Anwa actually will be uh, moderating today's space. Um, Anwa is a, a user experience researcher lead at Ledger, and he will be sort of uh, moderating the conversation with uh, Niawiya. And uh, yeah, we has uh, a really cool URL. Uh, it's called BTC divided by zero. And uh, yeah, yeah, we uh, maybe you could give us a little bit more information on what you do and what you're working on. Um, Zach, okay. um, just a little clarification because I think a lot of people they look at the name and they think, you know, what does that mean? BTC divided by zero. <laughs> what does that even mean? Um, actually, it was it was inspired by um, Max Kaiser actually. Um, so um, a lot of his sometimes when he had these um, discussions, he would mention that that the price of Bitcoin is going to infinity because the price of the USD is going to zero. So I figured, you know what, that would be me. As in, when it's divided by zero, it's divided by the fact that the dollar will go to zero. So essentially, it's, it's, it's indirectly saying the price of Bitcoin is, is in dollar value infinity. <laughs> That's what anything divided by zero is infinity. That's the the, the story behind that. So thanks to Max, Max Kaiser. That's where that came from. It's because my initial name was um when I first started um I mean, brief history about myself. So um my background is um Islamic law. So I, I got a degree in Islamic law from Medina University in Saudi Arabia. That was uh, I graduated two thousand eight. So um I think two thousand sixteen seventeen I kind of heard about Bitcoin went down the rabbit hole as, as we as we all do. Um. And then I think it was about 2020, I think it was, 2020, I decided to try and put some material and resources out there um, for the Muslims to help them navigate the space. Um, and initially, um, the idea was uh, is to help people navigate this, this, this whole crypto space. So that's where the name Crypto Hash Review came from. It was basically the idea that the, the, idea, the vision was that people would ask me questions about crypto and then I'll help give them guidance about whether or not it's halal or haram but as you can imagine over time i i, I grew tired of crypto to this um because essentially my message was always the same you know just stick to bitcoin um so essentially but i, I, I never really anticipated that the word or the name crypto would, would sound so dirty <laughs> it's now almost a dirty word now <laughs> it's a naughty word so um so that's why i kind of must rebrand or changed or remove that 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 part now, so it's no longer crypto hash review because I, that's I, again I, I no longer do reviews of crypto. I, I just basically said tell people to stick to Bitcoin. If you're gonna do anything, build and build Bitcoin, um, and that's basically where it is, and that's where we're at now. Really, we're at the stage now where Bitcoin is maturing. Um, you can pretty much build a lot of things now. On Bitcoin, you have Lightning Network, you have Arc, which is coming becoming a thing. You have Fedimint. You have so many different ways now you can build on Bitcoin, that really and truly there's no real need for altcoins. I mean, in the past, there was always the case to be made, oh, you know, Ethereum, it has, you know, it's true and complete, you can build anything on Ethereum, tokens, all kind of stuff. But 
we have all that now, really, on Bitcoin. It's just about now doing it. So that's that's where we're at at the moment. So that's essentially what I do, my primarily myself. I I still do my teaching Arabic and Islamic studies. I still I do, primarily speaking, um, but more and more, um, I'm moving towards um, still education, still Islamic education, but more helping people and directing people on how to navigate this space and more importantly how to use Bitcoin. Um, to develop the Muslim community, I guess you could say. Mm. That's a little bit of a rant there, but that's it, really. That's cool. Um, I've always been interested about your origin story. Uh, so you were naughty, you were into crypto first. That's why <laughs> a lot of people are like that, right? I mean, um, I wasn't really, the thing is, I wasn't really <laughs> into crypto in that regard. I, uh, I always saw Bitcoin as, as, as money. And, and for me, I was always into the idea that it would help me and Muslims Mm. to escape interest so that yeah. was always my primary mission um, okay but i wasn't i wasn't really necessarily anti-crypto at the time because especially in 2017 it was a lot of new ideas things seemed interesting seemed, things seemed exciting but i was never under the illusion that anything would replace yeah. bitcoin or be better than bitcoin but okay. over time you realize that the, the other coins they don't really serve any real purpose beyond pump and dumps and you know taking other people's bitcoin after them so okay you know, but nice. Yeah. Nice to see um, Adam is here. Mashallah. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Ahlan wa sahlan. Nice to see you here. <laughs> well, yeah, we should bring Adam here to talk as well. Um, maybe I will give a, I will give this uh, right to speak. Adam is from Bitcoin Malaysia, also very knowledgeable in Islamic finance. Um, yeah, just to give a context for everyone here that listening to the recording or like later joining in. We are going to host Indonesia Bitcoin Conference on October 26 to 27. Um, and then one of the topics that a lot of people, especially in Southeast Asia and in Islamic country, would like to discuss is about Islamic finance and what is the relationship with Bitcoin. And um, I think this topic will be, ex um, you know, we should explore this for sure at the conference. Um, Muawiyah is very knowledgeable in here. Uh, we have Anwar also who understand about Islamic finance and also Adam here. Um, you know, if you want to give like some two cents about what you are guys thinking about the relationship between um, Bitcoin and Islamic uh, finance. But maybe before I give it to Anwar, um, I can start the, the, the question to all of you. Um, why why there is a, why there is a problem uh, you know in the beginning like why there is a problem between a Muslim understanding about Bitcoin and what currently uh, what exactly that Muslim needs to do in terms of getting the most halal uh, finance uh, for for them yeah so maybe that's my my first question and anyone can answer and then after that anwar you can uh take over cool i was gonna say i, I wasn't going to answer the question i'll probably get more we had to speak deeper but i think uh, and, and i'm just making a disclaimer here that i'm not an islamic scholar right but i've i have an economics background and i've been interested in um islamic economics and western economics and how the whole international economic architecture works for a while now. Just uh, an interest and a student of knowledge, really. But I was going to say to, to Dia's question, I think one of the problems or issues for me is that humans have really short memory and a lot of people haven't really looked into how the current system has come about and how it has changed uh, compared to history from when the time that Islam first came, for example, and how it, it has developed and changed until now. Or like we're not living in the same system anymore. And like Moria can probably speak more on that in terms of how some of the other scholars today have the opposing view, right? That, that Bitcoin is haram and all that stuff. And some of these have been uh, derived from uh, historical, uh, I, I suppose, misconceptions, if you want to call it that. I'll, Pause it here for now and see what the others want to say. Yeah, I think if you were to, and I mean, pr pr primarily, I don't. I think what we are, we need to understand is that 
the problem we have here with especially with with, with people opposing um bitcoin specifically from an, from, from uh, an, Islam, an islamic perspective we shouldn't really think of it as a as a muslim problem it's more of a human problem and when i say human problem it's because money as a whole is about belief anyway um gold only really has uh, a stand in as as international money or the store of value only because we all believe that i mean no one thinks that palladium is an international store of money or or that platinum is the same although they i would i would one could argue that they they, they have more value per weight even saffron i mean saffron is 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 worth, is worth more than in its weight in, than than in gold but no one uses it as as money because that's not as, that's not an established belief so it's not i don't think it's it's necessarily a muslim problem per se but um what it is is that as muslims as as we are human beings when scholars look at the topic of money essentially they're looking at for the lens of a human how, as a normal human being would look at through their lens they look at okay this is the prevailing money we have today we have fiat for example this is what we know this is what we've established to be the case we have these rules and regulations which we can, which we can use and i think essentially what people misunderstand about scholars and this is this is this is not a slight against scholars this is just a reality of the situation scholars are just human beings and the islamic framework is exactly that in those words it's a framework as in if you look at islamic law it gives you boundaries guidelines on how to navigate the world but it doesn't actually necessarily give you a full-fledged um uh science if you put it that way that's why even the term islamic finance or islamic economics they're kind of deceiving in a way because if you look at if you look at the, the things like keynesian economics or austrian economics they're quite refined or or or, or detailed as a science they have writings on that topic and it's it's it's, it's you know refi- whereas if you look at islamic finance it's not really islamic finance because islam doesn't really give you there was never a thing called islamic finance from the beginning what we have is life <laughs> everyday life we live we we buy we sell we marry we divorce we have children we 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 have judicial law we have criminal we have all these things which is just part of being human and all islam does is say look in these avenues here are the things that you need to be aware of as you navigate your life these are things you should stay away from these are things that are recommended and beyond that you can do as you like so if anything it's a, it's more wide and spacious than 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 to be refined by a the particular um name or or title in that regards so back to the point of which initial question is why there is so much opposition i think it's just down to ignorance it, it just to get to long get long, long story short as in the same ignorance that would make jamie diamond be against bitcoin the same ignorance whereby you have all these economic economists against bitcoin the same ignorance that you, maybe your grandparents are against bitcoin this is just the same thing you know it's, it's a new thing it challenges our current belief system which is basically that fiat is money and that's that is a that is a belief system we can't no one can argue that one we believe that the dollar has value although we all acknowledge as facts that it's only pieces of paper but we believe that if I have this, I can exchange it for money. These, these are all beliefs. And now you have something which challenges that, and not only challenges it as an alternative, but actually says that the dollar is evil, that the dollar is bad, and that what you're doing is bad. That's, a, that's quite, a, that's quite um, a, a hard pill to swallow, to believe that a whole industry, economies of nations, are built on haram. And that entire books and, and courses and degrees are built on essentially a system of haram. That's a that's a that's a deep <laughs> that's, a, that's a deep pill to swallow, and it's going to take a while for people to to even consider this even a, a reality uh, before they even um, acknowledge it. And I have just and just to, just to close this point here, I have um, two there were two scholars, one called Sheikh Suleiman Al Rahili, who was my teacher in Saudi Arabia, and he's made he made a big long uh, half an hour video why Bitcoin is haram, and there's another Sheikh um, I think Nasser. Something else, that's on Barak or something like that. Two scholars from Saudi Arabia, both opposing views. One says Bitcoin is halal, one says Bitcoin is haram. And I did a video breakdown, if anyone wants to watch that, as to why um, they hold this haram and why they're incorrect. But what was interesting, it was just to highlight the point, just what was interesting is that even though 
So Sheikh Salman al-Haili said that it was haram. That's fine. Yeah, Sheikh, that's your opinion. Great. But even the other Sheikh, who said that Bitcoin is halal, I went through that in the video. If you look, look at actually why he said it was halal, he was still wrong. <laughs> As in, just to highlight that it's, the challenge, it isn't that, isn't that it, it's, um, it isn't that, that uh, there's something inherently wrong with Muslims. It's just that the, the, the perception of what Bitcoin is is, is, is is so different to what we are used to. That even when, when they give the correct fatwa, in my, in my view, that Bitcoin is halal, their perception of what Bitcoin is is still wrong. Um, so if you check out that video, so I think this is the last video I've ever done on my channel. But basically, I broke down, went down, went through the, the fatwa, and he went through the, how he explained why Bitcoin is halal. And the way he described it, that's not Bitcoin. He, he described Bitcoin as something completely different. So it, basically, in a nutshell, um, the conclusion is, over time, as we all are seeing, more and more people will come to know what Bitcoin is. And they'll come to realize how it works, how it functions. That's the first step. And the second step is belief. More and more people will start believing that it's not a Ponzi scheme, it's not a scam, and you can't just hack it. And the overall belief of the market would have, or confidence because they would grow. And then you'll start to see more and more and more scholars considering, maybe this is not actually a scam, maybe this is okay, and they'll start actually, actually looking into it deeper. And then you start seeing fatwa change, where fatwa might come out and say, yeah, it's actually halal because... X, Y, Z. And we've already seen that as, as it is. We've already seen that some scholars saying, I used to hold it was haram, but now I looked into it and I realized that all the objections I had against Bitcoin are already there in fiat. So not really objections. That's, that's what the scholars are saying themselves. But this take, again, this just takes time. Once they learn and educate themselves, like we all do, then I think things would, would eventually change. But in the meantime, I think I just want to close on this point. And in the meantime, I think what's important for us who are already here it's up to us to now see what we can build on Bitcoin, see what things we can change in our, in, in our communities, what things we can do that will help the Muslims or as, help mankind as a whole, really. So that when the scholars are, have arrived and they've, and they've seen what, 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 what Bitcoin really is, by that time, they will already see what has been built, all the benefits that they can have, how it can help communities, how it can help countries, how it can help people escape interest. Once we have those things, those that infrastructure in place, then this then it'll be easy. They'll be like, oh yeah, of course Bitcoin is halal. Actually, Bitcoin is more halal than fiat, and then, then we have a complete opposite for, for tower. But that will take time. But inshallah, we'll, we'll get there soon. Inshallah, we'll get there soon. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. That was um, that was a lot to unpack, that Sheikh. Um, <laughs> I was going to say that obviously I, I agree with the overarching um, goodness of Bitcoin and all that stuff, but. I, I do want to put some holes on some of the points that you mentioned there. Um, for example, going back to one of the first points you mentioned around that term Islamic economics, I think there's a nuance, right? So, for example, when you spoke about how Keynesianism and Austrian economics and stuff, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it made it sound, you made it sound like um, they came as like a package of sorts, whereas uh, you're making the claim that in Islam that there wasn't such a thing as uh, Islamic economics. But I was just going to say that my view of it is that there are certain principles um, and a lot of uh, guidelines that are economic in nature within the Quran, right? Like, for example, the prohibition of riba, like the encouragement of writing contracts before going into a trade and things like that. And of course, when it comes to Islamic economics, there are things like, um, for example, how the different heads uh, went about conducting the economy. For example, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did it in a certain way. Like He was saying that uh, things like, you know, you shouldn't fix prices and things like that. And then going across time during the Rashidun Caliphates, for example, they did things in a certain way. And I'm sure later down the line, a lot of other caliphs like started straying away from some of those principles and maybe uh, being more lax about having hard money in the system and things like that. So I think while there's no like preset package of what Islamic economic was, there are some or is there are some principles within Islam itself that informs what it should and could be right. And this is where I think Bitcoin comes in in terms of different scholars of different views of it because. A lot of them have and know this, 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 the, the Islamic economics, quote-unquote, Islamic economic sources. But then 
uh, certain things from their, I guess, like experiences or knowledge. And and to me, it's not just ignorance, but maybe some of them are on the side of caution, for example, right? I know some scholars who like see it more as like a, they think it's a new technology and a lot of the use cases now are speculative and Islamic economics is generally against that kind of behavior. So they're saying, like, okay, wait and see. So now they're saying it's not halal based on those reasons, but then they're taking a wait and see approach. And then, yeah, other scholars are, in my opinion, and no disrespect to any of them, right? It's They don't necessarily understand the way the current economic system works. And therefore, when they make rulings and fatwas, it's it's slightly off. But yeah, on, on the whole, I, I just wanted to get your views on that. And maybe we can uh, bring in Adam as well for this one. Yeah, so just just to quickly answer the, the, the what you mentioned, which is which is very true. So, Islam does come with uh, guidelines, <clears throat> but the reason why, the reason why I said Islam is this is not like a there isn't really a thing called Islamic economics or Islamic finance. In in the sense that the guidelines that Islam has are not economic in nature, if that makes sense. So it's not like we're saying um, the prohibition of riba is because Financially speaking, this would be bad for the market, and this and the other. And we have this economic model which projects. This. It's not. It's not like it's not economic necessarily in, in in that regards, but it's moral. So if you look at a lot of the guidelines um, that Islam has given us, you can almost summarize them as being moral guidelines, and uh, I guess you could say procedural guidelines. So you mentioned the idea of of writing down contracts. Yes, in the Quran, Allah mentions that if you take out a debt, a loan, then write it down. I'll even, I'll even mention it in a, on an order verb, which means like an, an obligation or something you highly recommended. If you take out money, Allah said, then write it down. Now, that's procedural. And the purpose of that is to, um, uh, what's the word? Is to prevent disputes. So it's, it's to do with how do you navigate business to minimize dispute so as to um, uh, grow social cohesion so you can almost say that the the, the the main purpose of actually that 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 economic instruction was not economic it was a moral um, advice to 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 fester um uh, brotherly brotherly uh, cohesion working together or for example i will mention uh, Allah, the, the message of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned hadith la ahadan ala bay'i don't sell on your brother's transaction I mean, if you're if you're if you have a marketplace and you have a stall next door to you, which is someone else, another marketplace, and a customer has come and they're negotiating with that with your with your you could say competition, it's not for you to now jump into the negotiation and offer a better deal. Again, that's not an economic. Um, uh, it's not an economic incentive. It's a moral one. You don't want to cause disputes and hard feelings between brothers of business. So if you, if you analyze a lot of the economic and Islamic um, guidelines when it comes to business, all of it, it comes down to, like I said, it comes down to moral um, imperatives, moral um, uh, uh, instructions, and things that infest and, and, and grow social cohesion. Even if you can even make, make a case for riba. You can even say that the, one, of the, one of the evil things about riba is that it destroys society because it, it, it puts one person at an unfair advantage over others. So, 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 if, if it's from that perspective, I'm saying that when I say Islamic finance is a bit of a funny thing because we, when you look at if you if you compare it to Keynesian and and all, all all the other sciences, they're looking at it from from the economic perspective in, uh, in that regards. Whereas, right, right. Um, Islam is is not necessarily looking at it from that. But you have to remember one thing as well. Uh, for a Muslim, you may turn away from a deal that is financially advantageous to you, but because it's more immoral. Yep. And that's that, that's that that from an economic perspective is counterintuitive. Economics is about making money, whereas Islam is not. About, it's not about making money. It's about doing that which is right. If that makes sense. So mm. you can see here that there's there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a divide between the two, and um, and this is why I think that Bitcoin can help Muslims incorporate the moral aspect to business because Islam has inherent features that makes it difficult to be mm. immoral. But we can discuss more about that a bit later. I don't want to take, talk, talk too much. I just, I just want to mention why I, why I said what I said. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Adam, did you want to add anything at this point? 
Assalamualaikum. Um, Hello. Uh, sorry. Can, can you uh, can I catch up a little bit on on the on the current question? Like what? Uh... And I think we, we've just nothing specific really. We've just been, uh, as you know, discussing where uh, Bitcoin fits into the whole uh, Islamic economic uh, framework, and um, what we were saying he didn't see Islam as having brought. Uh, economic concepts basically and that everything uh, in Islam yeah, generally so, is yeah, based so, so that that was a uh, yeah that was his, his point versus yours is kind of like roughly similar it's just like semantics probably but yeah yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I, I came to that conclusion at the end of what you said it's uh, probably semantics but let's let's get back to Bitcoin then more yeah so in the context you mentioned of moral um, how would you characterize Bitcoin as being moral then yeah, so it's not that it's that's that's a very 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 important point because some people I've had many people have pushed back to me uh, on on my you can almost say Islamic stance towards Bitcoin, saying that Bitcoin is just a tool. You can't bring Islam into this conversation, and in a way that's true. Just like you can't say there's there's, there's such a thing as an Islamic knife or an Islamic chair or an Islamic sofa. It's not really uh, a I, thing uh... like that pushback from the scholar community out of curiosity pardon are these pushbacks from the scholar community out of curiosity um no actually also from non-muslims actually when I, whenever i make posts about bitcoin and islam and whatnot they always say to you why are you bringing islam in this conversation bitcoin ah, is right. just bitcoin so okay. um so you're right that bitcoin isn't really something necessarily um uh, inherently Islamic. I can't say it in this, Satoshi Nakamoto was was a mufti. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> um, but what I what I do say is that because Bitcoin has properties um, akin to gold, not all properties, but some properties are akin to gold. There are properties that those properties makes it difficult to act immoral over a sustained period of time. So let me give you an example. There's an easy one, easy, easiest example to give would be the, the aspect of, of riba, interest. So if I was to give out interest-bearing loan in, uh, denominated in Bitcoin, it, it can be done, but no one, no one would really do that because they know that it's a deflationary currency. And interest, especially as a business model, only really works if it's in an inflationary environment, not in a, not a deflationary environment. So... The fact that Bitcoin is is deflationary by by necessity, that means that if I was to take out a loan in Bitcoin uh, and and on top of that accrue interest on that loan, that's technically suicide because you be it be it be increasingly more difficult to pay it back uh, as the price of Bitcoin goes up. I mean, it's difficult enough taking out a Bitcoin loan in a halal way where you don't we don't have to pay interest, let alone to do it in a a way we have to pay interest on, t- on top of that, so it, it disincentivizes you to to have to do interest on in that regard. That's, that's number one. Or another example would be the fact that um, it, it the idea of just giving you a non riba loan, just a loan where you, I give you one bitcoin, you pay me back one bitcoin, that actually does make sense now. Whereas in fiat, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if I said to you, I'm going to lend you ten pounds, or sorry, ten thousand pounds over a period of five years, and I want you to pay me back £10,000 at the end of five years. That's insane, because the fact of inflation, I'm losing money just by the fact of trying to do the right thing. Just trying to be a normal, everyday, halal Muslim, that deal is a bad deal, because I'm losing money. Whereas if I, just, if I was to lend you ten, uh, one Bitcoin over, ten peri- over a period of five years or ten years, that's an okay deal, actually, because that's, that's actually a very secure hodl. Because I'm hodling without the risk of, of losing my hodl because it's, just, it's now a liability. As long as I get back my, my, my Bitcoin, uh, I'm happy to hodl it for five years or ten years because I know that in those five years and ten years, at least it will be what it is, if not more. So, again, you see that by the, 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 the properties of Bitcoin, it makes um, being acting moral or acting in accordance with Islam make more sense. And there's plenty of there's plenty of examples. If you if you look at many of the examples of Islamic um, transactions, in terms like um, having the rahan, uh, having secure, securing a loan, there's many examples where where Bitcoin by its by its um, 
instant settlement feature, property, the ability to transact over long distances. There's so many things that what Bitcoin has that makes it uh, makes acting and behaving in a, in an Islamic manner more feasible and work better. Now, could you have those properties of other money, other types of money? Of course you can. I mean, as long as the other money has can do the same thing, it's not something unique to Bitcoin. I'm sure you could probably do the same things with. Ripple even, not that you will devise it, but you can do Ripple even. But, um, but obviously, um, because Bitcoin is decentralized, no central authority, no one that can control it. Again, it has, again, it, it has more properties akin to gold um, without, the, draw down, without the, the drawbacks of, of being like gold, and, you know, being heavy and hard to transport and the rest of it. So, so that's, that's, that's essentially my case. My case is not that Bitcoin is, 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 is um, Islamic in that regard, but that he has properties that allows a Muslim to behave Islamically without the drawdowns of, of fiat preventing you from doing that. That's, sorry, Dia, you go. <laughs> no, I, I just have a follow-up question. Like, so what, uh, from your point of view, Maui or even maybe Adam or Anwar, like what is this, it is, what is it needed for Muslim around the world to be, to really understand about, um, you know, that Bitcoin is more halal than, than fiat. I guess education is the key, but like, what is the, the most more impactful way to to educate Muslim about this matter? And I just want to say, oh, well, Abu Bakar is not here. I thought Abu Bakar was here. I want to invite him to talk as well, but uh, I guess he's not here anymore. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I met, I met Abu Bakar in... Uh, uh... In Prague, yeah, it's a like, Prague, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, go. going to the I, question. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I can go first on uh, uh, on the question like what is needed for for Muslims to suddenly wake up you know, to a to a reality that that Bitcoin is, or like fiat is supposed to be more haram than than Bitcoin, right? Yes. Um. Uh. I mean, unfortunately, I think most most of us is. We're she gonna have to learn it the hard way? I mean, uh, that means uh, probably like a, a systemic collapse of fiat currencies, especially in uh, Muslim majority countries, are gonna go down first, and and uh, people are gonna be fumbling about um, quite quite badly, and a lot of people are gonna be forced to. Uh, seek their own education uh, in this regard. I was in, I was in Turkey um, like last month. It was very, very interesting. Like you see a lot of, um, you see a lot of shops by the, uh, in all the tourist areas that, uh, that are exchanging, uh, well, not Bitcoin. I mean, they, they do have Bitcoin in their, in their signs. But they are mostly dealing with Tether. But it's still because Tether USD is still is still stable compared to the Turkish lira. Right? So, so there's a forcing function uh, that uh, that comes uh, that for it, it's a forcing function for for people there to to take up this education by themselves. Right? But I mean for. But for you know, for places for places like Malaysia, let's say where, where our ringgit is still very stable, I don't think like like Malaysians are gonna uh, are gonna take up that education voluntarily by themselves, unless they pick up uh, some books about it. Um, I, uh, I think I'm quite I'm, my my pessimistic view is that. Uh, Either it's going to be a top-down approach for most Muslim countries, or uh, our our fiat system is going to go down and the people are forced to uh, do whatever it takes to survive. Yeah, yeah I, have to, I have to agree uh, with Sheikh Adam because um, I think again I I, I tend to I, I I do feel that this is just a more human thing than than a, than a Muslim thing. As in human beings as a whole, don't really like change. Um, very few of us, you know, not, some of us do. Some of us always like the newest, latest tech. Some of us always buy the latest iPhone, the latest gadgets. Some of us always like, always like new things. 
But the vast majority of people don't like new things. They like to just do what they normally do and happy to just get on with what they need to get on. And that's why you find most people, their first introduction to Bitcoin is only about making more fiat. It takes a while before they get beyond that and start seeing Bitcoin as the actual goal um, rather than fiat being a goal. Even what I mentioned about in Turkey, uh, using USDT, that's, that's essentially that's the, the, they've already w- woken up to the reality that, that that blockchain, crypto is a better medium of exchange. But there's, there's, there's still many who haven't um, realized that, that Bitcoin is a better medium of all of them of, of exchange in terms of store value and the rest of it. So only those really who have that push, that need to make that change, will make that change. So either it will be their bank accounts got frozen and then they realized, wait, the banks, they're their point of failure. Either their currency will fail, like what's happening in Turkey. I mean, I just saw yesterday a, um, uh, a, uh, a video, like a little clip of the Google searches for Bitcoin by country. And in the last two to three years, Turkey has been second after America and literally came out of nowhere. It was not on the board, not in the top 10. And then literally in 2020, 2021, 2022, it just literally popped out of nowhere and it became number set, number two. Out of nowhere. But why? Because of Lira. So there was, a, there was a need. There was a push. And that's the case of everyone. I mean, especially in the, in the West, um, in, like in, in Western countries like, like UK and France and Germany, because we have a relatively stable country, uh, currency, it's mainly because of people want to get into pump and dumps. They want to get into this currency coin here, and want to get into this coin here, make more money, make, make more fiat. It's very rare to find people who have that, have that need. But I guess one thing that would help uh, in that adoption, in the other option of uh, basically being pu- pushed into Bitcoin, would be to give better alternatives. And I think this is where we have, this is our, our job. Our job is, it would be nice if Al-Bakr would, would come back, but that would be our job to, to do. I provide services and options that aren't possible in fiat, that are so compelling that there's a that you just have to now learn about Bitcoin. You, if you don't, then you you're missing out. That 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 will be basically same thing. With internet, internet was there from the 90s, but it didn't really kick off until the late noughties teens. Why? Because there's new there were new business opportunities on on social media, on your Twitters and your Facebooks and your all the other stuff. There was new ways of making money, new ways of getting traction and whatnot that you weren't getting off the internet. So I think that's I think that's basically what it is. We that this is why it's important for us to build things, uh, uh, procedures and optionalities that that just cannot be found elsewhere, that will force people to come in. I think that's, I think that's why we need to focus on on that on that. Agreed. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, guys. I was just going to say that just being conscious of time, um, I want to open up the floor for Q and A's for any listener who have any questions or points they want to share I have a question um, it's related to uh, Islamic charitable giving uh, I believe it's pronounced zakat right so how can Bitcoin be utilized to sort of enhance Islamic charitable giving actually um, so sorry so uh, off. yeah so uh, my my first year of uh, paying zakat on my Bitcoin holdings was actually to uh, to an Indonesian uh, startup charity. It's called Blossom Finance, uh, but it's not it's not Blossom fi- Finance per se. It's like I think the uh, one of the CEO referred me to like another Indonesian charity, and then I just directly sent my send send my. Uh, the amount that uh, the amount of Bitcoin that I have to pay zakat on to that person's address, like just just directly. Uh, the 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 subsequently like uh, subsequent years, I've been paying my zakat locally in Malaysia. Uh, I've partnered with a, a local uh, charity crowdfunding uh, companies called GlobalSadaka.com, where the list campaigns uh, from other charity charitable organizations. Some of them are zakat eligible, uh, 
and if you go to globalsadaka.com they have a, they have an option in the in the checkout page when you when you want to when you want to donate or you want to pay zakat on some of the campaigns that they they accept bitcoin on their payment gateway uh so it's quite i mean it's really quite straightforward uh really just uh, just take 2.5% of uh, of uh, the amount of bitcoin that you are, that you are uh it's eligible for zakat and then um, and then you uh, just send it directly to the uh to the collector uh and also like in malaysia most uh like all of the states actually came out with a zakat guideline on on crypto assets uh, like even one uh, uh the the kuala lumpur state like the like the capital uh so each each malaysian state has a zakat collection agency like a, a it's like a state zakat body so if you go to the website like one of them has a calculator for uh, to calculate how much uh bitcoin you have to pay like if you if you hold it uh for more than one year yeah thank you thanks for an answer and i also uh, i just realized that there might be a, a different type of uh, zakat with the invention of discovery of, of bitcoin so uh, what what comes to my mind is uh, michael saylor's uh, kind of idea uh, the ultimate donation is to buy with your private keys right So would that be a zakat like a donation to everybody as satoshi said so at, at the end of what you said so you said buy with private keys so that again yeah uh, so basically uh, michael saylor um, i heard him saying that on a podcast the ultimate uh, charity event that you can do is to basically uh, destroy your private keys or basically uh, die with your uh, mem- mem- after memorizing your private keys and uh, and yeah that's 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 what it is so so yeah well, what's your thoughts in terms of uh, uh that just because it's yeah michael seal's idea <laughs> and it's basically and also satoshi uh, did mention that in in in, in the forum consider it as a donation to the network yeah. if you yeah, lose your that's, that's a donation key. that's not zakat so in order to pay zakat okay, okay. Uh, yeah zakat has like seven uh, qualified uh, uh, recipients right So if you burn your private key you can't really direct it to like any of the seven. So I wouldn't consider it as a card. I mean you could you could Perfect. think of it as, don- as an infat like donation but it wouldn't be a card. And also I would, you would essentially if you do- if you donate in yeah, again it would be a card if you donate in money to the network or to the bitcoin holders that's indiscriminate that means that means even Satoshi who has 1 million bitcoin even he's getting donated to I mean Well, would it's not as encouraging to give donations to those who are already rich. You are supposed to give donate to those who are who are uh, poor. Well, well, those who are poor are not other people who who, who receive the zakat. So I think that's what Adam was saying. The zakat is has its recipients, and you have to you have to direct it to those recipients. And it, the zakat is not valid if people who who you gave it to are not recipients or don't deserve that, and you have to give it again. So you couldn't really do that, and and interesting because Marco Sayla, I've, I've watched many of his his discussions, and um, uh, he has many good, interesting ideas when it comes to about thermodynamic balance and that kind of stuff. He has a lot of good ideas, but on a financial level, um, he still has the same old, um, I would say, ideas about finance that is against Islam. Primarily, for example, his idea of never selling a Bitcoin and just taking out loans on Bitcoin at a certain premium. Oh, that's a certain percentage lower than the percentage. Oh, he has many ideas which which oppose Islam, and this is, I would say, one of, one of those examples of of that. Um, b- burning your your private keys or burn, burn your Bitcoin would be a terrible idea, especially as Islam actually prohibits the destruction of wealth. It's not allowed to destroy money or destroy wealth. It's a that's a a, a big prohibition. Um, what a better thing to do is just give it to someone who can use it. All right. Um I think we are almost at the end of this um uh Twitter space. I would love uh to, you know, explore more about this topic. So if everyone here would like to to discuss more and then like uh you know, really dig deep into Islamic finance and Bitcoin, 
we're going to have this topic at Indonesia Bitcoin Conference. Again, uh, you can see in the tweet, um, the conference is going to be on October 26th to 27th. Muawiyah is going to be there, you know, and uh, Anwar as well. And I guess Adam as well. So it's going to be fun. We are, um, we, yeah, I mean, it's going to be in Bali um, in October 26th, 27th. <laughs> Where else that, you know, fun place to talk about uh, Islamic finance near the beach. <laughs> So uh, if anyone haven't bought the ticket, the ticket is on sale uh, on the 21st of July. The price is going to be increased. So, you know, secure a ticket as soon as possible. I would like to thank to Anwar, Muawiyah, and Adam for, uh, you know, giving your two cents about Islamic finance. Thank you so much. I would like to thank as well everyone in here who uh, attended and listening to uh, this Twitter space. We are going to have Twitter space every week, every Thursday, around the same time, like around uh, 9 p.m. Bali time. I don't know uh, what is it in your time zone, but it's in 9 p.m. Bali time every Thursday. Um, just stay tuned in our channel, Indonesia Bitcoin Conference. Uh, yeah, we, we will post like, you know, we will engage with several other speakers that are going to be coming to Bali to the Bitcoin conference. Um, again, the website to buy the ticket is at indonesiabitcoinconference.com. If you have any question, you can just DM us in our Twitter. Thanks again, KeepLab, for hosting this. And thank you, Anwar. Thank you, Mawia. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone who's listening. And I'll see you again at uh, the different Twitter space. Bye-bye. Cool. Jumpa lagi. Bye-bye. See you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih. Bye-bye.